Follow these steps to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Step 1. Find the YouTube app on your device. 
Step 2. Select the app, then tap on the search icon. Step 3. Type in Mission Live GND and complete your search. Step 4. Select our Mission Live GND channel and subscribe. After you have successfully subscribed, tap the little bell icon and select all. You will be notified whenever we go live. If you are still experiencing difficulties in finding our live stream, please tap on videos and you will be directed to our most recent video feeds. Thank you for subscribing. Hi, good morning. We wish you a terrific Tuesday. We welcome you back to another episode of the Pastor's Corner, where we always have relevant topics and, you know, current issues to discuss. Now, usually we talk about theological um, discussions. We sometimes touch political matters. But today we'll be delving into a social issue. Today we'll be looking at the issues of in-laws and stepchildren. Probably you may be in the boat. Probably you may have a friend Probably you may be thinking of entering into a relationship with someone that already has children. Probably you want to understand, how do I navigate my relationship with my father-in-law, my mother-in-law? Where do we draw the boundaries? If you're interested, you've got to stay tuned. And of course, we invite you to share the link with all your friends. We'll be having a, a very nice hot topic this morning. One we believe that can revolutionize your relationship, or probably it can help one of your friends. But before we delve further... We ask that you will pause with us as we have a word of prayer, as we invite God to take full charge and control over our discussion today. Father God, we thank you so much for the blessings of life. We thank you, God, for relationships. We thank you for wisdom. We thank you for the spirit of discernment. But, oh God, most importantly, we thank you for your guidance. This morning, as we are about to discuss, we do ask that you will touch our minds we pray that we will reference your word, your holy word, as we give fitting responses to the different questions. I want to lift up Pastor Gittin, Sister Bola, as they give their responses. May you season their lips, O God, and prepare their answers so that persons in need can be satisfied and even encouraged by the responses put forward. So into your hands we lift up all those who will be looking on. May we all have a blessed experience today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Today we have two special people in studio with us. To my immediate right, we have Pastor Charles Gittens, currently serves as the pastor of the Northeastern District, and he is our former Family Life Director. And next to him, as we usually say, we have the rose among the thorns. I don't know if Pastor Gittens would agree with that, but we are happy to have Sister Clara Bola, who currently serves as the Family Life Director and the Education Director. And I believe two persons that are well qualified for the topic that we have this morning. So today, just in case you missed the introduction, we'll be looking at the issues of dealing with in-laws and stepchildren. Without any further ado, let the discussion begin. Our first question this morning. Um, now, stepchildren, many persons um, have different concepts or different theories in terms of how they relate to stepchildren. We want to first answer that question. How can one respond to the suggestion or the notion that stepchildren are illegitimate children? How can we best respond to that statement? Well, first of all, good morning to our viewers and listeners. A, an illegitimate child is one born out of wedlock. So a child who is born out of wedlock is considered illegitimate but when we add step child to illegitimate not all stepchildren are illegitimate 
some stepchildren come out of other marriage broken marriage relationships so we can say that not all stepchildren are illegitimate based on the definition that an illegitimate child is one born out of wedlock um, in in responding uh, I have I heard clearly what sister Clara said and that's the definition uh, however what I want to bring to the discussion as that is asked that children are extremely valuable and children uh, Psalm 127 verse 4 says children are a heritage of the Lord uh, so in spite of the clear definition mentioned uh, we as parents and other individuals need to always bear in mind uh, that the term illegitimate should not be in our head once we are referring to a child. Why? Because children never ask to come into this world. Uh, we brought them here. So in spite of the fact uh, whether or not they were born outside of wedlock or within wedlock, the child is innocent and should be treated very special and taken care of uh, at all costs. Because treating the child very special uh, is going to help that child in terms of future development and giving that child psychological balance to be able to face the world boldly. Lovely. Um, Sister Bola, just a follow-up question. Now, in the eyes of God, do you think that there are anything or there is anything like an illegitimate child? No. All children are heritage of the Lord. Praise God. So, no matter what circumstances the child may have come into the world, it is God's child. He said, children are my heritage. So, they should all be treated equally. There is no step parenting with God. He is all of us father. Amen. Wonderful. Um, we just want to just interact with our online viewers just a little bit. Um, a special good morning to you, Lizda Alexander. And a happy Tuesday to you as well. And uh, Alicia Stephen is agreeing with Pastor Gittens. Correct, Pastor. Um, Glenda is also saying there is no such thing as stepchildren. They are all children and should be treated equally. And I think that we, we are agreeing with that. Well said, Pastor. I don't agree. Um... With, with, with the opening statement. And just to confirm, um, Sister Bola was simply stating the laws of the land. We're not saying that this is our stance. So I'm, I'm not sure if Sister Bola would just want to clarify definition. the opening statement um, or the, clarif the definition of illegitimate children. That's the dictionary's definition. Okay. The dictionary's definition of an illegitimate child is one born out of wedlock. But we have already established the fact that all children are an heritage of the Lord. So there are no illegitimate or stepchildren where God is concerned. Lovely. So I think we got um, a bit of clarity with that day. You know, panelists, um, we have to take so much precaution when entering into relationships, especially in this day and age. Now, if there are some persons looking on this morning and are thinking of getting into relationships where children are already involved, what are some precautions you would like to share with them today? Well, well first, first, there should be total discussion and counseling uh, that needs to happen in terms of, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's print the scenario. Uh, one person has two children already. The other has one, and they are coming into a relationship uh, where now they want to get married. Uh, within the counseling session, uh, the searching questions need to be asked. Uh, then, too, uh, both individuals should be honest and open and say, for instance, uh, who is the father of X and Y? Because remember... You are now coming, father as well as mother, you're now coming into a relationship and plan to live in a home uh, with individuals who were strangers before. Then too, 
uh, the father for whoever the child is or the mother, uh, biological father, uh, and non-biological in this case, well, people will say step, should be introduced because now you are getting into a marriage and you may be seen at the mall with somebody else's son. So it is right and proper for you to be have been introduced to who is this real father. It may not be that you are on a friendly basis, but that introduction need to be made. So, you know, living arrangement, all of this needs to be discussed thoroughly before individuals come into the marriage. Well, I would add, we need to find out and figure out the roles that each parent would play in that new family. Because the child who is in that family also has another parent somewhere else. So we need to figure out what the role of the other parents would be. Would the parent be allowed to visit the child? Would the parent be allowed to finance the child? Would the parent be allowed visiting rights? Or would the child be allowed visiting rights? So these are some of the things that we have to look at. The conflict management. If the child complains to the other parent, how do we handle that kind of conflict? Because the child has another parent. So when you're getting into that kind of relationship, it changes the whole dynamics. So it's, it's now my child and your child. So how do we deal with that child who has become our child? Amen. Just to, just to add uh, something to what Sister Clara said, it is right and proper for both parents, well, step-parent and biological parent, to agree how we're going to move forward in terms of disciplining this child who is not my biological child. That's, that discussion needs to be done in the absence of the child. Yeah. Very good points. Very good points. And just before you move away from that, communication. How will the information be communicated? Would the parents speak directly to the child or would the parents speak to the other parent? You know, I have known of cases where the father would meet the child maybe in school and give them money to bring home. Should, all of that needs to be sorted out. So uh, the child comes with something and say, Daddy, give me that. Or Mommy gave me this. So there should be some kind of communication where it would be decided who takes responsibility for that kind of relationship. Would the mother be given or would the child be given? And uh, I think coming out of the point shared, we see the need for proper counseling. You know, many times people fall in love, they jump in love, um, they grow in love, and sometimes they avoid that stage. Mm -hmm. But some of these deep and penetrating questions that you, you brought up there, sometimes we can easily scheme over them. So we just want to encourage our viewers, you may be in a situation like that, um, falling in love with someone that already has children, Probably you have, have a child or children. Someone is falling in love with you. We just want to remind you how important it is to get some good, solid counseling, you know, that can help you clear the air, properly discuss, openly communicate some of these piercing issues. So when the family arrangement begins, it would not be like a shocker for you. So we just want to emphasize that point there. Now we want to look at that concept of sibling rivalry. Um, it's one of the oldest family problems that we have. <laughs> When we go back to Cain and Abel, Esau and Jacob, many siblings fought and they strove, even in Bible times. And the truth is, the reality continues today. Now, when you add stepchildren in the mix, it becomes even more technical. What can parents do to avoid and prevent that issue of sibling rivalry, especially with stepchildren in the mix? Well, I believe there should be discussion we would say we look at the age of the children and if they're big enough to have a discussion if the child is a toddler baby then the dynamics would be different but if you have preteens you have teens you have young adults there should be some discussion so you sit down and you lay whatever the issues on the table that is creating the problem and then you try to find a workable 
situation. We're not in a perfect world, and it's not going to work out perfectly, but at least there will be some um, guidelines. There will be some boundaries. There would be, you know, a formula that we're working with that will make life a little bit more comfortable. Another thing, you try to avoid the favoritism. We are all human beings, and when we have biological children, we have stepchildren, the tendency is to lean towards our child. But we have to. We saw it happen with um, Joseph and his brothers, and he could have caused him his death. He said they did it for evil. God worked it out for good. But sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. So we have to remember to not show favoritism and make it so blaring that the children are aware of who is the favorite from who is not the favorite. So when it comes to sibling rivalry, I believe there is a discussion should be had so that it makes things a little easier to work in the home. Um, just following up, I um, agree fully with you, Sister Clara. Um, no preferential treatment. Try to avoid preferential treatment. Uh, now, just to follow up, uh, it is good, based on the ages of the children, uh, to be having family conferences where the children from the two parents are involved and these children help to make the rules as to how the home is going to be run and how discipline would be meted out. Uh, then too, many times we don't think about this. Sometimes when the children are of a certain age, the advice may be that they should live in different homes. I've actually seen it work. Uh, now, obviously, I'm not talking about primary school children. I actually see it work where teenagers, they were advised to live in different homes, and that worked out fine for the parents. So that's, that's a suggestion also. But the thing about family conferences and the children uh, sitting there together with the family and helping to make the rules, listen, that works real good. Amen. All right, good point so far. Um, just in case you just tuned in, today we are looking at dealing with in-laws and stepchildren. And so far we have looked at three questions. We have had some excellent responses so far. But I just have a, a little question to just place the panelists on the hot seat. So let's say, for example, two persons are discussing the issue of marriage. Um, they both have children. And one of the partners in particular, their children are wholly and solely not in favor of the marriage. And uh, it is so to the extent that it can cause a lot of problems and drama in the home. Do you think that pe person should uh, refrain from getting into that relationship solely based on the children's um, failure to accept them? Or should love conquer all at the end of the day and just go through and deal with the, the results of whatever comes? Because so often I hear of that. A woman wants to get married to a man, but the children are not in favor. They would cause havoc. The man can't come there, or vice versa. Um, do, should there ever be a boundary where the adults and the parents could make their own decision, regardless of how the children feel? Uh, well, uh, you, you drop that at us. And the first thing I would want to ask, well, why, why the children don't want their mom to be married to this individual? Well, let me answer. Have they, yeah. Sometimes it could be <laughs> um, one of their parents died. Mm. Probably they are not over the, the grieving process yet. Okay. They can't stand to see mom with All another right. man. Okay. Dad is in the head, you know. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, 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 look at it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, one time, I did a wedding and a girl was crying. Uh, she was primary school age. And I asked the grandmother, why is she crying? And the grandmother said, well, because the mother marry and she will travel soon. So I turned to the girl. I knew her well. I said, you realize that if your mom didn't marry, one day, you, when you get old enough, you will marry and leave. So she watched at me, dried her eyes, because there was a clear understanding that my mom is making this step now of leaving. Uh, but if she didn't do it at some point in the future, 
I may have left my mom and go and marry to somebody else. Uh, so sometimes, sometimes clarity, but that was, that was a, a young child. Uh, now, older individuals, sometimes a decision may need to be made where uh, the two people can go ahead and marry, uh, but uh, that lady, well, I'm swinging it wrong, maybe not the exact answer, the lady who the guy is marrying to, uh, should not, I would advise, she should not be brought into that home to live at the mercy of those daughters who don't want the dad to get married in the first place. That would be a recipe for chaos. Yeah. And I will take the next side of it. Mm, all right. Uh -huh. the, the young men may not want their mother to get married. Maybe right. it's just a little being selfish. Yeah. Mm. You know, they compare any person to maybe their dad. Mm. And, you know, the person maybe doesn't mm. meet up to the standard that mm. they believe should be. Mm. So the, the same solution. Maybe just find a different home mm -hmm. right. where you can mm. set up your own home mm. and leave the matrimonial home mm. to the children. If they are big enough, if yes. they are old enough. Because mm. sometimes the older adults are the ones who are not really keen on the other parent moving on. Mm. But eventually they move on. And as you rightly said... The parent is left on their own. Mm -hmm. So we have to balance it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And don't do it out of selfishness. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. seek the other person's interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. All right, we want to go to a very sensitive one. Now, involving stepchildren and stepparents opens the doors for sexual abuse. We have incest happening. Stepdaughters with stepfather, stepsons with stepmothers, and even step siblings among themselves. How can parents prevent the possibility of sexual abuse or even incest happening in that blended family? What can they do? Well, this one is, is a little technical, but I would say you have to set boundaries. So there needs to be a conversation between the children that these children are now going to be joining us. They are going to be your family. They are not your biological brother or sister, but because the family is becoming one, then it would look like, and that's how it should be, that these are now your new brothers and sisters. And brothers and sisters do not have sexual relations with their brothers and sisters. So you, you set that rule and then you set boundaries. So if it's males and females, the females have their section, the males have their section. They know what it means to, the girls are in the bathroom, the boys must wait. The girls are getting dressed in the bedroom, the boys must wait. And may I extend it to the parent as well? Parent must speak to the other parent and say, well, this is my daughter. She, she's coming to live here with us, but remember, me and me alone should be your responsibility and attraction, not my daughter. Because sometimes things could really get out of hand, you know? And also, the children must be spoken to. So if it's young ladies, you say to them, okay, now you are accustomed walking around in your undies because it was just us. But now we have a new daddy, a new man in the house. You won't be walking around in your undies. You will dress yourself so that you don't, you know, you don't parade yourself. Mm. Yeah. So that conversation needs to be had as well. So before you, you, you jump in on Pastor Gittins, um, back to your sister Bola. So in the case, for example, little children are involved, let's say under the age of five. Um, let's say a mother has a daughter. Um, so let's say you have a blended family now. Should the stepfather ever entertain the idea, even with permission from the mother, to bathe the female daughter? What do you think? How does that sound? Well, it's not advisable. It's not advisable. It may happen, and it may be okay, but it's not advisable. It's not advisable. Mm -hmm. um, um, Sister Bola, thanks a lot for that input. Uh, directly on spot, I would want to add that within that blended family, Children must be encouraged to say what makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. Because on many occasions, things are happening 
in front of our faces. But because these children do not have the freedom to discuss anything with the parents, uh, it goes untouched, whatever is the issue, it's there. So it's very important that children must feel comfortable uh, saying what is happening and what makes them uncomfortable, reporting to the parents and us not saying whether biological or step, uh, I don't want to hear that, or, or body language saying that, um, do, don't bring up that conversation now. The conversation concerning the sexuality or what makes them uncomfortable should be allowed at any point in time, even at the breakfast table when they are eating. Yeah. That's very, very important. I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we ignore the warning signs and then it blossoms into very uncomfortable situations. So we nip it in the bud. We give the children the freedom to say what is happening. Yeah. Not to make accusations, yeah. but to say what makes them comfortable, mm -hmm. uncomfortable, as Pastor Gittins rightly said. So who should you trust more? Your new spouse or your child? <laughs> who should you trust more? You should trust the information that is shared. Interesting. Um, <laughs> um, how, in asking that, I, won't, I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> but what I want to say is that uh, my relationship with my children should be of such that, okay, it's ongoing, and of such, I know they won't lie about X or Y. Uh, this child has been with me for 15 years. Why would this child change the pattern of the conversation and want to lie all of a sudden? So I, I'm answering the question by saying, I know who I was with, meaning my children, for X number of years. Uh, I'm going to always want to lean to that force because that's how, that's how we got along well and we understood each other. Yeah. All right, good responses so far. Um, we are about to take a short break for an item of special music. Just in case you're tuning late, we are looking at in-laws and stepchildren. You know sometimes in-laws become outlaws? Sometimes stepchildren actually feel like steps, walked upon, trodden upon. But today we want to explore and delve into that topic, how God expects us to interact with our in-laws and our stepchildren, our stepparents. We invite you, don't go anywhere, stay tuned in, continue to share the link with a friend as we continue this all-important topic today. And at this time, just relax as we are blessed by an item of song. <laughs> When darkness 
Amen. God's grace is always greater than sin. Even in the realms of stepchildren, in-laws, we make mistakes. But as Pastor Morgan would remind us, we should get back up. Welcome back to the Pastor's Corner. And today we are looking at that very um, relevant, sensitive, technical topic of in-laws and stepchildren. Um, during the break, we got um, a nice message um, in the form of a question. And I think it would be fitting that we share it with you. And we would want to hear your comments, your feedback as well, as we share in the discussion here today. And the question goes like this. What if the spouse wants the children to live with them, and the stepchildren are being rude and disrespectful to the stepparent? What should be done in that case? So how do we handle rude stepchildren? Um, actually, that happens pretty often especially when the children are older. Uh, so we still come back to explaining, well, the biological mother will have to explain to the children uh, how they ought to behave in terms of, this is now my husband. He's not your father. You need to be respectful and how they need to behave. And as often as they get out of hand, she needs to make sure she do that discussion, explanation, whatever she has to do to get that into the head. Uh, letting them know that, listen, uh, one day uh, you are going to try to build your own home and your own family with your husband. You wouldn't like for that to happen also. So, so as I say, it happens all the time, but it shouldn't... People shouldn't just close a, a eye to it. It should be corrected because it's the happiness of the mom they are affecting there. Yeah. Well said. And I would add to that, do not side with the children. We know they're rude and they're disrespectful, but because it's our children, we take their side and make the other person very uncomfortable. So, if it's wrong to be rude and to be disrespectful, we say that to the children. This is not behavior that we will tolerate. If you have a problem and you need some help, let me find some help for you. But I will not tolerate the fact that you are going to be here and you are going to be disrespectful to the other person, whether it's Amen. the lady or the man. So, just to... 
clarify what you both just said. So the mother or the parent should take the initiative and not the step parent. The biological parent should. Yes. Yeah, I would say that. So, so if the biological parent is not stepping up, is there ever a time when the step parent should address them? Well, he can, he or she can, by saying, I am not in favor of what you are saying to me. I don't like it. I think it's time to stop. I think we need to have a conversation about this. Sometimes I am saying it and make it sound very smooth, but it could be quite rocky mm -hmm. having to come into a new relationship and then have all of these extra things to deal with. But if the biological parent is not stepping up, then the step parent need to, in, in a respectful way too, because two wrongs are going to make it right, say, I am not accepting of this kind of behavior. I do not like what you're doing or saying. And, you know, confront the situation and let them know that this is not something I am prepared to live with. Just, just to add to Sister Clara, you know, uh, when that is being done, a very good thing would be for the, bio, the step parent, one, for the biological parent to be in the presence, mm -hmm. right? That is one. And two, for the step parent to ask these children clearly, what do you all expect to achieve, mm -hmm. right? And get a feedback from them. As Sister Clara said, um, that conversation may not go smoothly. It may not go smoothly, but, but, but opening it up that way may cause them to see exactly what is in their mind yeah. and what they're expecting to achieve. Right. Right. Yeah. What, he, what he's thinking. Yeah. Yes. yes. So, so I love the points there, and um, clearly throughout the program, the, the business of communication and trashing yeah. things out is coming out um, in a nice, open, amicable manner. Very good. Um, we have some comments here. Um, Alicia is saying some of these children will still be disrespectful no matter what. Mm -hmm. Blended families takes a lot of work. And those going into it just have to know that mm -hmm. and work as hard as possible to make it work. Very good. Um, it is the ideal for newlyweds to be on their own, but that is not always so. Mm -hmm. Hence, a workable framework must be made while the couple is working to become independent. And I think we're going to touch on that just now um, as we look at in-laws. Um, Carol is saying the biological children's parent is usually unhappy and has not gotten over the other person why they allow the children to disrespect the step parent. Mm. Mm. Deep point there. Mm. So probably subconscious, you're still grieving, dealing with it, and you just allow the children to have their way. Very true. So we're going back to our fifth question. You know in life there are many do's and don'ts um, for nearly everything in life. Are there some things that step parents should never ever do well i will take the hard answer and i'll hope i get to take the softer one <laughs> thanks <laughs> step parents should never sexually engage their children mm. at no time whatsoever that is something that they should never do Nice. No sexual contact in any way or form. No. Yeah. I go with that fully, 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 because if that is allowed, that can destroy a person psychologically. could affect them for a lifetime. Another don't, I would say, is that in terms of uh, disciplining, uh, people, these two parents need to well, the non-biological parent needs to get permission from the biological parent so to discipline that child. Yeah, you need to, right? Now, I didn't say hit, you know. I didn't say hit. But to discipline in the absence of, to talk to, to scold, to correct, etc., etc. Sometimes people uh, say things like, don't, don't touch my child. Don't talk to my child so, right? This is two individuals, biological and non-biological. That shouldn't be. Uh, the two of you should have that agreement. When I'm absent, go ahead. Do what you have to do in terms of correcting, guiding, assisting this child to go in the correct way. And you're saying that that should be communicated clearly first. Yes. So yeah. the step-parent should not take on his or her own and discipline in the absence of the biological parents. 
No, that discussion should have been Must gone be had before. Yes. Very good. Very yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Yes, that because that goes back to earlier when we said, what are they going to? What the expectations are? Mm -hmm. How are they going to manage this new relationship? Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that had to be discussed. Mm -hmm. So now, is it still your child and my child, or is it our child that I am free to discipline mm -hmm. once you're not there? All right, we head over now to in-laws. In-laws or outlaws? That is the question. <laughs> um, we want to look at that question. Are there any real dangers in getting too close to your in-laws? Um, viewing audience, we'd like to hear from you. Are there uh, any real dangers getting too close to the in-laws? Well, well, first, I'm not answering that quickly, right? First, I must say uh, that People sometimes make a lot of jokes about father-in-law or, well, not so much father-in-law, a lot about mothers-in-law. And as I look at life, I realize that uh, at one stage, you're a father and time lasts, <laughs> you end up making the transition and you become a father-in-law. So let me hear a point out before I go to answering that. You know, parents-in-law should be treated with respect because I got my spouse because of my parents-in-law. That's important. We must respect them and we should not speak about them as if they're absent. We should speak about them as if they're present. Uh, having said that, you ask, are there real dangers in getting too close? Yes, they are. Uh, because if you're going over by your in-laws, very often, <coughs> you're eating at the home, you're sleeping over at the home, and you're very often in the presence. Uh, in the mind, it's only a matter of time before they say, well, if all of this is happening and they're at us all the time, let us run the life for them. So being too close can cause in-laws to want to run your life and to meddle in your family life. Never badmouth your in-laws. Right. Because when you speak badly of your husband's in-laws, mm. remember, he is not taking that nicely. The same way you would not like him to badmouth your other side of the family. Mm. So you try to avoid badmouthing. Mm -hmm. And we understand very well what that means. Yes. So you do not have to run to your in-laws for everything if there is a big decision to make and you're not sure which way to go it's okay to let the voice of age and reasoning help you but other things you can manage like what i'll cook today you have to call mommy and ask her what do you think i should cook today or you find i should go in town these are decisions that you, you the two of you must make together so you must be able to do these things on your own. Mm -hmm. Because if you do not set boundaries, after a while, as Pastor Gittins rightly say, they will be the one running the life because everything you have to do, you must consult first. Hey, how come all you didn't tell me all you're doing this? How come all you didn't tell me you're all doing that? There must be things that you could do without them knowing that you do it. Mm -hmm. You only share information if mm -hmm. you want to be respectful. Mm -hmm. You know? So you say, well, you know, we bought a new car. Hey, all you buy a new car and all you tell me nothing? <laughs> no, that decision had to be made between the spouses. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. now you're saying, come out and see our new car that we bought, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so you set informational boundaries too. So you know what to share and what not to share. So you don't go about sharing. Your, you know you have your own little family circle and there are things that should stay just between the two of you. Then you have the decision-making boundaries. Who makes the decision? Is your father still making the decision? Is your mother still making the decision? Or both of you working together to come up with a workable decision? So, yes, in-laws have their place, but we need to set boundaries. And I like how um, Solomon puts it. He says, debate your case with your neighbor, but do not disclose the secret to one another. So you may throw information out, see what they're thinking, but when it comes to the final decision, it should be yours. 
And you know what he says again in Proverbs 25, 17? Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, lest he become wary of you and hate you. So, you don't always have to go to the place. Yes, you exchange visits, but it doesn't have to be all the time. Because after a while, it's like you get fed up with them or they get fed up with you. All right, we want to go to probably one of the most debated questions for the program today. Discussing your partners or your spouses' faults or flaws with in-laws. Now, I want to ask a question like this. Do you think it is ethical or moral for a spouse to discuss the faults or the shortcomings of the others with his or her in-laws? So in other words, if I have a problem with my wife, should I tell my parents or my wife's parents about her? If she has an issue with me, should she tell our parents about me? How, how do we deal with that? I believe it is, it is not the best thing to discuss. Because if you tell my parents about me, they will take my side. And if you tell your parents about me, they will take your side. So there will always be a side to be taken. So it is always never the best thing to discuss the, the flaws. If there is need for discussion, you may just want to speak to a counselor or you may want to speak to a pastor who may be a neutral person. So they listen and they will be able to walk you through whatever it is. Not necessarily give you an advice, but walk you through so you can come up with some workable um, solutions to whatever the issues are. But when you begin to tell on the other, sides begin to take. You see, you take out my daughter in my house, and now you're making her see trouble. You take out my son in the house, he can't even get a decent piece of food to eat. You know? So people start taking sides. So it is always never the best thing to do. Um, the, the thing about us human beings is that we like to remember the negative. And spouses sometimes have wranglings, issues, conflicts that they, you know, they pass through, discuss. Sometimes they shout at each other. That's the reality of marriage. Uh, but if you take that situation out of that context and tell your your in-laws, which is your wife's people, you may move on from whatever was that conflict area or that challenge. You may move on. But in-laws, which is my wife's people, they don't forget that so easy. I said people like to remember the negative. So you would have had that conflict. You and your wife settled it. And she happy going about her business. But you have told her people. So they are seeing you in a certain light ever after as if uh, that was never settled. Uh, that's, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, the other thing is, I wouldn't say that you should never discuss stuff with your in-laws. But a good way to deal with that is if myself and wife, we have a situation and she says, Charles, let us take this to your father. It may be a conflict situation too. Let us take this to your father and let us see what he would say. Now, she has invited that. Now, by the way, it's left now for me to agree or disagree. If I agree, it should be that, listen, this one thing we are taking to Daddy Jerome, right? And see what he has to say about it. Uh, that may be a safer way to go. But to, uh, and when, when she does that, it should be that item alone. Don't spring up anything else. That's, that's, how, that's how I see it. But taking this stuff uh, to in-laws, a big no-no. A big no-no. So, so basically you're saying if 
there should be a chance where a matter should be taken to the in-laws. Mm -hmm. It should be mutually agreed upon. Uh, right. Yeah. So if I want to take a matter to the in-law and my wife does not agree, I shouldn't. I should. You know, you should. Okay. Sister Bola, let's, so let's hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Good? Good. Yeah, I, I agree as well. And I'm looking at the chat and somebody's asking why you can tell your parents but you're telling others. Because others do not have a special interest. Mm. And not just others, but professional others do not have a particular interest in this story. Mm. So they will tell you this is right, this is wrong. Maybe you could try this or maybe you could do that. But when you take it to parents, parents usually take the side mm. of their child. Mm. So if I go to my dad, he takes my side. If I go to my mom, she takes my side. And similarly with the, the other person. So it is always never the best thing in a conflicting situation to tell your in-laws. Um, so let's just look at um, another real-life scenario. So let's say, for example, a husband or a wife, they, they have a very frustrating ongoing issue um, probably with the other partner. Um, they begging, let's go for counseling. Begging, let's go for help. Um, but you think that your in-law, your dad or your mo mom-in-law might be a very mature, objective person. But you really need help, eh? Mm -hmm. So it's not a case where you're just talking for talking's sake. Mm -hmm. But that person refuses to go for the help with you. They refuse to change. And you're struggling there alone. What should you do? As a counselor now, I would suggest that you say to the person, you think you don't need the help, and I think I do. So I'm letting you know that I will be seeking help for my own personal benefits and my mental health and what have you. But you never do it in secret so the person eventually find out and then trust is broken. You say to the person, okay, you think you are okay and you don't need help, but I believe I need help, so I am going to seek help. You may even say who you will seek help from so the person knows is somebody that can be trusted. Because I don't want to take sides here, but sometimes ladies believe that they could do with some help, but men believe that they are okay. Careful and now. I am not taking sides here. <laughs> I am just saying what is. You know? Sometimes men want to go forward. Ladies think that everything is okay. But I would suggest if you think you really need help, do not suffer in silence. Find a professional and talk it well, well, actually, um, Sister Clara, I'm in full agreement with what you've said. Um, actually, it could be that seeking help, the situation may not change, but it is going to help the individual mentally, and that is important. Yeah. It's going to ease them just by rehashing and uh, going through what has been happening that in itself is going to help the individual. So I agree that if one party doesn't want to go and the other one senses that they need help, uh, they should be allowed to go and should say also, disclose, that I'm going for help. Now you said something that anecdotally, um, I've, I've checked it, right, in terms of folks I'm dealing with. I've checked it that many times, the female is the one who would reach out and say she wants help. I've checked that anecdotally. Uh, but the man, a lot of times, uh, when the ship is sinking already or the ship gone down already, that's when he is going to agree to. So you said something there. Anecdotally, I've proven that that is, that is correct. Thank you for supporting yeah. me, Pastor yeah. Gittins. Uh, I noticed way. Pastor Jerry was not too, too happy with that, but thanks for supporting me. Uh, by the way, Sister Clara, you know, if you go back to the Bible, first wedding at Cana, right, yeah. is a lady asked for help. Eh? <laughs> you, you know, but I, I fully agree um, with, with what was said. Eh? Um, I believe when a couple needs help, they should talk. They should ask for help. They yes. should discuss yes. it. Yes. And yes. both parties should be, should be mature enough. Mm. And as you rightly alluded, you know, sometimes we as men, we like to solve our problems ourselves. Mm -hmm. We suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes ego. Sometimes we might be afraid. Eh? That person might say, I need help or mm -hmm. I can't handle, I can't manage. Mm -hmm. So we appeal to the men out there as well, you yes. know. Um, yes. If there, there are ongoing issues, seek help. Somebody that you trust. No man is an island. 
Sometimes we need clarity on something. And it doesn't mean that asking for help that something is wrong with you, you know. <laughs> it's just a normal part <laughs> of the marriage experience. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Pastor Jamie, you know, um, something is said about parents. I don't remember the detail, but about parents taking to the parent and the parent being a professional like Sister Clara, like myself. Uh, you, you, you alluded to something like that. Uh, you know, what I discover is that some children, because they understand your stand in staying out of their family matter, they're going to bring it to you in a parable-like way. <laughs> and, and, and actually, it's, it's your opinion, the quoting, yeah. but they bring it to you uh, in a distancing yeah. parable-like way. <laughs> so, make so it sound as though yeah, it's, it's somebody else's story. <laughs> but really, as a parent, you read through it and realize it's, it's yours. Uh, but it's always good mm -hmm. when on the mm. other side of that, that they could, the in-law could come to you and mm. discuss with you, mm. not in, you know, not in, in way to make conflict, mm -hmm. but in a way to get help mm -hmm. so that maybe, you know, you can even speak to the, your child mm. and say, you know, I have noticed that this is happening. Maybe not even quoting the person, but saying I have been noticing what's happening here mm. and give some guidelines, you know, concerning mm. what you have been noticing. Yeah. So as a parent too, as an in-law parent, mm -hmm. we should also be noticing, being mm -hmm. aware, mm -hmm. so that we can actually help our child mm -hmm. through whatever the situation. I notice yeah. you alone look very happy these days. What's happening here? Yeah. And it's not being nosy. It's just that as a parent, you will notice that things yeah. are not, you know. So they may not want to say, yes, everything is okay. Well, mm -hmm. everything is okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but I'm just a little concerned. Yeah. Right? So we spoke to the ideal, the healthy, that it's good to talk, especially when matters are serious. Um, we want to speak now on the other side of the defense. Um, is it a bad thing when spouses talk too much, too frequently, or too easily to in-laws? Is it a bad thing? Is it a bad thing? It could be a bad thing. But it also has to do with the relationship that you have with the person. So if it's a nice, open relationship, then you could talk. But depending on the relationship, then some things are better not said. So depending on the relationship, it could be a good thing. Depending on the relationship, it could be a bad thing. Like Pastor Gittins alluded to earlier, that after you would have moved on, they still hold that information for you. Mm -hmm. So you have to know who you're dealing with and know how much to say and what not to say. The, uh, Sister Clara, you, you, you put your finger on it. Your relationship with your daughter-in-law or with your son-in-law is key to the answer to that question. Uh, and the kind of respect they have or don't have for you is key to the answer for that question. Uh, and so on many occasions, le let me just be a little personal in terms of something. Um, I'm a father-in-law three times. Now, on many occasions, uh, I am always trying to see in a conversation how I can understand how my son-in-law or how my two daughters-in-law are thinking. Because it's easy for me to know how my children are thinking. So I always want to hear how they are thinking on a matter. And a good way to understand that is not to take a side, but just to listen and ask prying questions from them as to how they are thinking on a matter because they didn't grow up with me. Sure. Right? Yeah. And if, 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 I'm like, if I'm like taking a side quickly as they open them out, I wouldn't get to know how they are thinking. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we have room just for one more question and we want to live on a positive note. What are some benefits that can be derived from a healthy in-law relationship? The positives. Okay, now marriage creates a new family. 
So when you get married, you actually marry into a family, mm -hmm. not just the person. Because you're going to be carrying that other person's last name mm -hmm. if you are a woman and the man has taken on a wife. So she's going to be a new member of the family. Sometimes I listen to marriage so, um, ceremonies and there would be things like, well, I'm losing my son. No, you're not losing your son. You're gaining a daughter because that person is going to be added to the other side of the family. So both families gain two children, right? So being an in-law is a gain. And as I said earlier, sometimes the reason why we don't like the person is just because we are being a little selfish. We believe that they are taking away from us. But we, if we embrace the other person, we realize that we have not lost, we have gained. So marriage is about bringing two people together, two different backgrounds. Now you're trying to blend into one. There'll be little friction here and there. It may not fit quite as you would like it to. But with time, things will work out. So in-laws are good, but it depends on who in-laws make themselves to be. All right. Um, you, you spoke about benefits. Um, let me give you a humorous one. I am short. My, wife, my wife's family, they are taller. Benefits? Well, my two sons tower above me. You may look at that lightly. I, d I didn't think about that before I got married, you know. But that's a benefit in terms of the biological mix that causes my sons not to be as short as me. That's one. Uh, but you can multiply that in terms of, I'm dealing with benefits, in terms of childbearing. Uh, I'm speaking from a wife's point of view now. First child. Listen. Um, her mother-in-law and in-laws from that side, which is her in-laws, my people, right? She benefited a lot by talking to them, they explaining what to expect, etc. in terms of pregnancy, whatnot, right? That happens. In terms of a positive based on uh, how godly the people are, your in-laws are, they can assist also in child training and setting a good godly example for uh, you who have married into that family. Uh, so there are a lot of benefits. And as Sister Clara said, in-laws are good. We got our spouses from them. Let us respect them and let us always be aware that this new family that Sister Clara has pointed out have be begun, this new family, let us understand don't rob the next generation of having the opportunity of interacting with the in-laws. I'm glad you made that point because I was coming to it. Mm -hmm. The next generation, mm -hmm. the grandchildren, mm -hmm. belong to both right. sides of the family. Very important. Yes. So if we do not have a good relationship mm -hmm. with the in-laws, mm -hmm. it means that those children mm -hmm. would miss Yeah. And you don't want them no, to no. miss. People mm -hmm. always like to talk about a grandmother mm -hmm. and a grandfather, mm -hmm. you know? So give that generation a chance mm -hmm. to do the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well said. Um, we're just about to conclude our program for this morning. And I think we had a, a wonderful time. Yeah. yeah. Um, we touched some sensitive and relative areas, in-laws, um, stepchildren, stepparents. But some of the points that came out was proper communication, full disclosure, respect, and also understanding what you are getting into. You know, you've got to count the costs before you enter um, into some of these relationships. But above all, we know that we can find comfort, guidance in the Word of God, and we know that as long as we put God at the center of our relationships, by His grace and His strength and His leading, these relationships can be successful. We want to thank you for tuning in to the Pastor's Corner today. And we pray that your relationships will be better as a result. You may be an in-law. Please don't be an outlaw. Always be a positive support to your children. Um, you may also be a stepchild or a stepparent. But let's understanding and tact, you know, be some of the watchwords that you abide by. May God continue to bless you all. 
And of course, remember to tune in tonight at 7 p.m. Um, for the rest of the week and the upcoming weeks for our Good News Gospel Explosion. We know that God loves the family. His desire is to save all his sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. And by God's grace, you have the opportunity. So enjoy the rest of the day. And again, thanks for all your contributions. And may the good God continue to bless you.